maybe Jerry, you can start with this. If somebody out there was saying, you know, I don't know if I have a problem, I'm fine. What does mental health mean to you? And, and I think that that will allow other people to relate a little bit easier to what they're looking for or where they might fit into this. Yeah. So I think that's a great question. Um, so personally for me, um, like mental health is just health. And I say that very, very intentionally because, you know, I think especially in a lot of our communities, there's, there's work that needs to be done to like reduce the stigma. You know, I think when people have a cold and people have a flu, they don't worry about, oh, like, should I go get help? Should I go, go and do the first step? But I notice, I think for mental health, sometimes people think it's like something separate. And I know, especially for many of the founders who are listening, who are out there, like I, you know, I think all of us know that we have like for us to be able to achieve and to make sure that our startup is working at the highest potential in our teams. It's like so much of it is based on our leadership, which then is also based on our mental health. Like, do we feel good right now? Do, do we feel productive? Like, are we, are we think, are we also healthy in that sense? So that's what it means to me. And Mike, how about yourself? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I would say it's a combination of feeling okay uh, with the crap that life throws my way and or maybe not feeling okay, but being confident that I'm going to get through it and that I have the resources around me to navigate it smoothly. And then I'd say on the other side of that is, do I enjoy my life? Do I have moments of happiness and, and pleasure and um, and it's also, I'd say, heavily based on my uh, close personal relationships. Uh, I don't like quoting research too often, but, you know, close social connections are usually the number one determinant of, you know, health and well-being. So that's a, a really important one to me. So when those are going well and I'm getting along with my wife and children, then usually I'm in good shape. Oh, fair enough. And Anna, how about yourself? So for me, it really is about uh, being able to connect with the moment and the people around me. So connecting with the moment, meaning like being very passionate about what I'm doing and feeling like it's purpose oriented. It ha makes sense. It brings meaning to my life and feeling, yeah, that connect, that emotional connection with others is very, very important to me. And I, for me, a sign that something's not well in mental health is when I don't feel that connection anymore um, and something disconnected and you know my mind is somewhere else instead of being more present. Okay uh, and Jeff and yourself? Yeah no I, I, I think for me that the biggest thing is it's mental health is is learning how to show the same compassion that you show to your friends, family, um, even strangers on the, street, on the street, learning how to show the same compassion that you show to others that we're all trained and skilled at and showing it to yourself. Um, I think we all know how to help coach a friend through a bad breakup, breakup or we you know how to help someone who's lost a job and give them good advice. But for whatever reasons, because we haven't learned the skill when we find ourselves in those situations ourselves and we're left with our own thoughts, um, we don't know how to have those conversations most of the time if our mental health is suffering. So it's learning how to build that compassion, build that rapport with that internal dialogue of yourself so that you can navigate these stressful situations in a mentally healthy way. Agreed. Uh, Luke, how about you? Yeah, it's a tough to go last one. We've kind of hit the bingo card of what mental health does mean to, to me as well. But I can state uh, the one kind of buzzword that, that hasn't been stated yet is just the concept of resiliency. So when the event that something comes up, um, just how to have the tools to effectively like work through it and be resilient, as opposed to uh, potentially spiraling down um, into places that I, I know I've been and Mike's open about <laughs> has been in the past. Um, and one thing for me specifically is when I know I have a support system. So if I have a support system that I can easily access and uh, not needing to access it or feeling like I have the tools to work through it effectively without needing to reach out for that additional support is kind of when I know I'm, I'm humming along, but also knowing um, that I should reach out. And it's, there's, no, there's no harm in reaching out to the people that I need uh, when I do need it uh, has been very helpful for me in having a positive. Uh, balanced mental health state. And I think you, you, you touched on, everybody touched on a lot of great points and what, what this really means to you from uh, resourcing, happiness, uh, emotional connection, um, compassion, 
uh, all of these facets really kind of give you uh, what you look for when you're trying to help others or maybe even help yourself. And I think, um, Luke, you mentioned something about re resiliency, but I think you mentioned something about being able to um, talk about your problem. And I think maybe one of the fears for a, a leader or an owner of a company, or maybe even just being a, a parent uh, or a, a brother or a sister, where do you feel that you're able to leverage this and how do you get yourself to communicate? How do you get yourself to feel, is it vulnerable? What is that mental state that you need to be in where you decide to ask for help? Is it when you're at the bottom and things couldn't get any worse? Or how do you start to feel that I need to do this right away? I need to talk about it. Where do you feel that comes in and how can you share to help us um, in the future be able to combat this? Yeah, so I can, uh, thinking back to my days in corporate consulting, like you, you knew you could never tell your boss you were having a mental health day. So I had the flu a lot. Like I had the, the flu a lot um, at that point. And I think my experience is pretty comparable to most. So um, like I was hospitalized with anxiety or I thought I was having a heart attack. Um, that's kind of the point that, that uh, for me was when I started recognizing that it was a mental health issue. When when you feel that and you can start understanding that it's not a heart attack and you you feel what that feels like in your body, that sometimes it does take, that's not the bottom by any stretch, that, that was my bottom, but um, th that's when I realized that I could reach out and get help. Um, for our perspective with our company, the goal was to ensure that it doesn't it doesn't have to hit that point. The reason it did hit that point is the way that most companies or people get their education on mental health is in the last page of their benefits handbook. It's just like a complete afterthought as to how this is brought up. So physical health, like going to the gym, and it's very different now than it was to age myself when I was a corporate consultant. But I think the more that we can move this conversation past uh, the back page of a benefits handbook or this concept of like, Bell, let's talk, which is good. But the question is like, where do you go if you, you need to talk? Like you can go, you, if you find Mike's firm, then you can go speak to Mike, that's great. But it's not always the, the easiest to find someone like Mike that can help you through those problems. And I think the more that we can just make people aware where these systems are and understanding that this is kind of what it feels like when you're spiraling out of control, the more that people can get help before uh, having to be in the hospital for it. No, and that, I, I think you touched on a, a lot of great points and, and you mentioned something about it being in the last page and how do you fix that? And I think this goes back to Jeff, some of the stories you talked about, uh, which were working with a lot of people in the high pressure sales job uh, being able to uh, figure out how am I going to get to that next sale? How am I going to break through all of this? And having a lot more mental breakdowns uh, because of the high pressure role. Uh, how do you feel this this works inside of uh, uh, what you guys are doing in your business? Yeah, so I think I think there's a lot of things that have changed recently. Like I think um, specifically within within sales, or even if you're a founder, like we all have the same goals. We want to we want to build a great company, or we want to um, get promoted to sales manager. So the, the goals are the same, but the problem is the process that we've, that we've been executing on, whether it's showing up to work, making our dials, you know, building out this great team internally and then having to let them go uh, on our way to building a great company. Like our process, our how of achieving these goals have has been shattered overnight in the span of four weeks. And it's frustrating because we still have these goals, these very valid goals of what we want to achieve, but we're stuck because we don't know how to do it anymore. And my, the way I explain this to, to people is the goal was never about building a great company or getting promoted. It was all about becoming a great company or becoming a sales manager. So it's revisiting and going back to identifying building that into your identity of what would a great company be doing right now? Envision yourself as already have becoming a great company. How would they be navigating this? Me personally, my business is all, all in-person workshop consulting type of projects that I was doing with sales team specifically. That's gone, my process was smashed, but I have pivoted and now I'm working on building out an online course that is totally different and outside my comfort zone, but that's what a great company would be doing. If you're a salesperson and you're still have that goal of becoming a sales manager, 
what would a great sales manager be doing right now? They'd be experimenting with their messaging. They'd be, um, you know, supporting each other. They'd be uh, prioritizing professional development. So that is, that's, that's, that's re really important. And I think sort of the, the second thing I'll say is it's, it's really dangerous when you start to feel like a failure. Like it's important to have that dif difference between um, you have failed at something, the act of failing, versus I feel like a failure. Right now, it's very easy to feel like a failure, and that's that hurts because it's poor identity change. But getting back to realizing that if you've had to let people go and you didn't do it as best as you thought you could, it doesn't mean you're a failure. You may have failed at doing that as best as possible, but if that's objective. You can learn from that. You can, when it's an act and it's objective, you can always find ways to learn and grow, but don't take that personally. It's, you'll, you'll, you should never feel like a failure. It's, it's the act of failing versus fe becoming and feeling like a failure that you need to be mindful of. So you're pretty much, you're, you're putting a target and you're still shooting for the target, but you might lower that target down just so that you have incremental wins so you can keep your focus, uh, keep your mental um, side of things in check. Uh, but if things fail, don't take it as a negative. Don't fall back and repress yourself. Uh, because at the end of the day, you're going to make mistakes. You got to keep striving forward and keep having a little target and try to make little wins to keep yourself positive. 100%. And it, it goes back to finding you having these micro targets will help you redevelop and test that new process, figuring out that new how of, that will get you to that, to that new goal that you're trying or that goal that you've always had. No, that's perfect. And um, Anna, you mentioned um, that a lot of the things that you've done over the years uh, when you're doing your research and building out different ways to, to help people figure out their way around all the different uh, tools and processes in, in mental health, one thing you touched on was uh, group work. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's some leadership side of things that says, you know what, maybe I might be going through some stuff uh, in my personal life or my business, but maybe if I put that as a group thing, maybe I bring my family to the table and we talk about it, or I bring my team together and talk about it. Uh, is there any things on that side of it that you feel might be a real benefit to others out there if they have a struggle just trying to figure out themselves how to work through this, that they might be able to do it in a larger group? Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of value to that, that actually when you keep it to yourself and you don't actually look for that support or you're, sometimes we have this uh, barrier to being vulnerable in front of other people. We feel like if we show vulnerability, it's like we're weak and uh, people won't respect us as much, especially as a leader. Um, you should look like a fortress um, and, and, and exude that resiliency, right? Um, and I think actually people respond very well if you're vulnerable and say, you know, I'm having a bad day or I'm having uh, negative thoughts. Obviously, there's a balance between being way too open uh, and oversharing, but I think that expressing some of that hu humanity and some of that vulnerability actually makes people connect with you more. Um, and I think that that connection can actually help the group dynamic uh, rather than damage it. And, and, it, and I don't think I've ever seen it damage an image uh, of a leader either. I think people actually respect you more um, because, again, I think it's, if, it's, uh, if you're someone that's never suffered from mental health, maybe things haven't been hard in a sense, you know, like um, you never had to overcome that. And I think that when you're able to model that, like I'm here for you and I'm still working towards my business and my goals on top or parallel to the fact that I'm feeling anxiety, it can make people respect you even more and definitely look up to you more. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. And, and uh, Cherry, you talked a, little, a lot about this because you do work with a lot of executives that, you know, two years ago, they didn't want to share anything. And then over time, they started to open up a little bit more. Um, can you share a little bit about that process and how it ties in with what uh, Anna was saying? Yeah, I mean, so for transparency, right? Like I, I've been obsessed about like, psychology and mental health and those things for like 12 years. Like that's actually my initial training and I have two certifications, executive coaching. And I did that because when I was younger, I actually really struggled a lot with mental health and I've been very public about this. So, I mean, in terms of mental health and also experience around trauma, surviving trauma, it's 20 years of my life. So, uh, you know, I grew up in poverty, um, you know, have had experiences around depression, anxiety, panic attacks, PTSD from my car accidents. It was a lot. And when I went through the experience back in 2018, where, you know, really frankly, I was dealing with 
lawyers, right? Because of the company that we had, we had signed a nine figure deal. That was the deal that my brother and his co-founder signed for our company. It was a major deal. You know, I was dealing with like um, just grief and whatnot. And um, the experience I had of like the community at the time was like, oh, I have a lot of friends and investors and people who are, you know, like friends, I know they care, but how come I feel like I don't know who I can talk to about what I'm going through? And so I, I went and I actually interviewed 50, uh, 50 founders in the first three months. And I had one-on-one -on -one conversations to see, like, is it just me who's like going through this or are other people going through it? And what was surprising for me at the time was um, 35 of the 50 who I talked to told me that the number one reason why they felt that they previously failed in their business was because they felt like they were avoiding the conversation. So topics like, hey, like I know we're scaling and I, I, I know that my co-founder is not the right person for this and I should actually ask them if they're willing to step down. And then they waited until the company was about to like go bankrupt. Or it's like, oh, I know like we ran out of money. I should ask my VC to help me. The, my, my VC who was from the last round to help me do this new raise, didn't ask until we were almost bankrupt. And it was a lot of those kind of conversations. And then when you start going deeper into it, you realize that the way that we show up, for example, in business, like if we're not having honest conversations, then where else are you also not having it? So for example, like as a founder, like I often educate founders and VCs on that, that, you know, it's not just like, mental health necessarily just only appears in entrepreneurship. If there's other things happening in your life, then sometimes that also affects our leadership as well. And I've been very honest about that. Like for me to be relaunching our brand on the same month as, you know, what would have been, let's say my brother's birthday, there are triggers, there's grief that comes up for me. And so I'm very conscious about that. And then I have practice around that so that when I show up for my people, I'm not bringing all my baggage and all my things. And so I just want to share that to a lot of the founders out there that I know there are things that people are going through. Like I have already entrepreneur friends who, for example, have lost friends or family to COVID right? These are real realities. And so just be compassionate with yourself and also know that there are other people who are going through it. And, you know, if you're reaching out, let's see if you're just reaching out even to one person, it makes a difference. And it doesn't have to be, let's say your investor, if you don't feel comfortable, you can even just be a family friend or like somebody that you know from, um, from let's say a hobby group or things like that. No, you're, you're right. And sometimes uh, you really do have to figure out who that one person is and, and start to share a little bit to give a little and, and figure where you'll net out. And, and somebody, um, I think I learned over time is that uh, when you reach for help or you ask someone for help, everybody's willing to give it to you. And uh, you just have to try. Uh, I, I think that brings us to, to Mike, where uh, I learned a lot about in our discussion about the same thing, where uh, you went through a lot of things um, throughout your, your career. And uh, you did the, I think you did the right things where you reached out and you communicated a lot. So I find that mental health is really about communication. Um, maybe Mike, you can talk a little bit about how your communication has helped you kind of shift through everything that you've gone through. Sure. Um, to just briefly note a couple of things that were discussed earlier. I like uh, Luke mentioned, you know, we want to create these environments where people don't have to get to the darkest place before they start asking for help, which is why these conversations are so helpful because it's just a modeling behavior and people certainly learn from that. Um, unfortunately, you know, I was in the darkest place I had to be to ask for help. But once I started to ask for help, every person I asked, just like you said, was willing to help and was happy to help even more so. And the more people I asked for help and the larger my circle of support got, the healthier I got, the better I felt, the more comfortable I felt navigating difficult situations. Um, and as that built up, then I was able to give that back. So a huge part, it seems counterintuitive, but a huge part of, you know, being well and, and keeping our shit together, so to speak, is helping other people so if we're feeling like crap and and having a hard day the simple act of just doing something for somebody else is so incredibly powerful so in a lot of and i love also what anna spoke about in terms of groups i mean i'm part of a lot of mindfulness 
groups and and other sort of peer support groups and there's a magic that happens when you're in a room full of people being vulnerable and sincere and etc so that's another part of learning to communicate and it's a process not a destination it takes practice just like anything else there's no you know i one of my mentors said to me two things unfortunately life punishes us first then teaches us the lesson and then the other thing you said was you can't think your way into right action you have to act your way into right thinking and that was you know, we often think just because we say something out loud or we think something, that means we've done it. It's like some weird psychological mechanism that tricks us into thinking we've sort of solved an issue because we think it or say it. So it actually has to happen. You have to take action and slowly but surely, you know, the mind follows the body, I guess. And I don't know. I mean, for me, keeping things inside makes me sick, like emotionally, mentally sick. And so I have to do that for my own sanity. Um, but I would say, you know, maybe some people need to start small baby steps. I don't know if anyone's seen What About Bob, but there's a great scene of baby steps when he's trying to be forced out of his house. Uh, anyway, that's a lovely, a lovely scene. And I have to, I can't keep this in. One of the things I would say that people don't know about me is I love seeing into people's personal lives through the Zoom camera. And I love, I love the bumblebee. Is that a bumblebee there, Luke, under the plant? Yeah, awesome. Anyway, I hope that's helpful. Uh, no, 100% it is. And I think one of the things that kind of is really encompassing all of this, and we've chatted about this too, and um, is how do we normalize, normalize this whole process? How do we make people feel comfortable that it's okay to share, that it's okay to get into a group and just have a powwow and talk about how we're all feeling and how we're all stressed about the change that's going on. Uh, how do we, how do we structure that? And how do I find, you know, one or two people that may have my back and they want to listen more to what I have to say and help me steer through things. But at the same time, I know I'm going to help other people do the same. So what do we got to do to, to normalize that? And uh, I think one thing that triggers in my mind to, to kind of start it off, Cherry, was when uh, you were, um, when we were at Fireside and we were uh, chatting with, uh, Peter Katz, and you guys came up with this really cool, exciting, um, almost like a 12-step process. And uh, I took that piece of paper home because I was so excited for it. I literally hunted down because everybody took them all until I found one. Um, and it was memorabilia, I guess, because I never take anything from anywhere because I don't like stuff. But that I did take home. And, and maybe you want to share a little bit about that, but how that actually could help other people normalize this and feel comfortable because I think the whole thing at the end of all of this from communicating and groups um, and being vulnerable, it's how do I normalize this so that like Mike said, I want to feel happy. I want to feel content and sharing just takes away so much of the pain that's there. And if I can normalize this, then all those other things won't matter anymore because it'll be easy to move forward. Yeah, that's a great question. And also thanks for sharing that fireside story. It's nice to know the impact <laughs> around our work. Um, so I think one thing I'll say, and this, this is something that that's come up with a lot of founders, right? So we have around 75 public champions. So these are people who are in a place where they feel ready and safe to share their story, but we actually serve our community right now actually has 200 CEOs. So there's another 130 or so who are not in the place where it feels safe to do that for, for whatever reason. And so, you know, one thing that I tell people sometimes is that some people who are sometimes hesitate the first step. It's because sometimes they feel like, oh, the share that they have to share has to be so big. It's like, I have to go out and share everything. Like, I got to share that I've been struggling with depression for five years. And, oh, like, you didn't know all this stuff about me. And when we put those expectations on ourselves, on like, on like, what is the right way to share, it actually makes the sharing a lot harder than it needs to be. So to give a really great example, um, when I was going through my experience of grief, like, really frankly, uh, I didn't leave my house for three months. Like I was really struggling just even with the basic stuff. I went from, from like being a, you know, being a sibling entrepreneur because my brother and I, we were founders together for 14 years. And then all of a sudden being an only child. And it was very, very disorienting. It was very shocking. And right now, even what's happening with COVID is very shocking for a lot of people. And one of the things that I did when I didn't, at the time, I wasn't ready to talk about him was I started going up to my friends, like, like after, 
you know, when I was ready and I started saying, Hey, um, can, can we just like hang out? Like, like I, I would love to just like, I, I, like, I miss you. I would just love for us to connect. And, you know, I remember a few months later, what happened was, um, so there's a friend of mine, another founder who also went through a car accident and we can sometimes joke about that. That's like our connection for our friendship. But, you know, she and I, we were both going through a tough time. And one of the things that we did was like, we weren't ready to talk about that part. And so we started telling our friends, hey, like, you know, we actually just want to create a jam where we can like keep each other accountable to our goals and just have a place where we can safely share. And that one event um, became so successful and people were so connected that people are just like, can we just do this every month? And now that's become a mastermind that I've had over the last year and a half. And so even when you share, it doesn't necessarily always have to come from like the deep, deepest, heaviest place. It's almost like an onion. Like you can even start, if you're building up safety for yourself you, and trust in that other person, because it's also important to know that if you're sharing something vulnerable, that the other person is also in a place to receive it, that they honor it, that they also respect it. And so you can even start by sharing like pieces of onion. So, hey, I gave you these two parts of my onion. Wait and see how they receive it. And it's like, oh, good. Okay, then I'm going to go and give another layer of my onion. So I think that's really important in terms of safe sharing. Oh, safe sharing. I, I agree. There, and you got to start small because I'm sure this is going to be tough for everybody, right? Um, Luke, on your end, how do you normalize this? How do you feel people can normalize this? I really like the onion example for like two reasons and one is I like think of my dad and if I like put too much onion in the food that I'm cooking my dad he'll like he hates it and like so the onion works both ways like some people cannot stomach the full onion so you can you can maybe start you know like who can eat one layer who can eat two and who can just bite the whole raw onion like an apple and your therapist can eat the onion like an apple and that's that's what they're there for and you're your social network are those that you like dice it finely and, and try to figure out how, how much you can share. So thanks for that, Cherry. That was not pre-rehearsed by Cherry and I, by the way, but maybe maybe we'll do that again one day. Yeah, I don't know. Like for me, uh, my friends always say that I'm like the person that wants to, like I'm the most active on our threads, always organizing things. And it was it was unique for them to realize that that's not that's not about me being like a social butterfly. It's, it's, it's like kind of selfish. Like, like, like I need to, I need to spend time with you to get stuff off. And um, one of the things that's specifically interesting about entrepreneurship and it's almost hypocritical is like I'm building a mental health company. We're at like 22 employees right now. And the whole economy and VC market has just potentially like been pulled out from underneath us. So it's kind of this paradox of, um, literally putting yourself through one of the most stressful situations while trying to prevent other people from going like <laughs> like having a manageable stress load so uh, for me it's just about communicating I'll say the same thing as Cherry it's it's knowing that the investors in my company invested in a mental health company so I'm allowed to be vulnerable I don't need to be this like complete alpha version of myself um, it's just being genuine and uh, for me, it's like a mix of talking to my family, friends, therapists, uh, and investors, just so that everyone knows what's going on and I'm not holding anything inside uh, that doesn't need to be, be held inside or held inside rather. Oh, that's perfect. And I, and I do appreciate the genuine side and, and uh, letting people feel comfortable to be able to approach you or have you do the same. Um, Anna, on your end, how do you normalize this? So I think uh, a little bit, as uh, Sherry and uh, have already talked about, I think that the key here is um, really talking about it. It's the only way of normalizing it. I think we've normalized being resilient and not having mental health issues. Um, and I think the more we talk about the more vulnerable side of ourselves, the more we normalize it. And then we also fear rejection less. I think people really deep down why they don't share is because they're really afraid that they're going to get rejected because they don't like that part of themselves. I, I don't know why uh, in our culture or how we're brought up for a lot of us, it's like that dirty part of us that we don't want anybody to see. Um, and we just want them to see like, you know, like our Instagram or, you know, Tinder profile, like that perfect side of us instead of seeing the messy side. And I think that um, you don't want to show too much, like Sherry was saying uh, all at once, but I do think, showing people that other side of you just a little bit and seeing that they don't actually reject it 
and they might even connect with you on it, uh, might help you also uh, accept it. You know, part of that self-acceptance that's so important. And once you accept that side of you, it's going to be a lot easier for you to be vulnerable, uh, to normalize it as part of who you are, rather than just, you know, trying to hide it all the time. Oh, that's that's great. You're you're right. It's uh, it's accepting yourself, uh, your faults, your fears, and just moving forward. In a, uh, I guess a little bit as you go. Everything seems to be a little bit. Don't take it in stride. Don't go all the way in. Jeff, how about your side? How do you uh, how do you normalize all this? Yes, yeah, so it's something that I've been working on for the last um, last little or like almost like probably the last two or three years. It's really helped me and kind of the salespeople that I work with and 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 just like my friends and family. Like we need to move the conversation around. Um, always asking what's wrong. What's wrong? When we see someone crying, we ask what's wrong. Or someone gets upset, what's wrong? And in reality, nothing is usually wrong. Like the question that we need to be encouraging people to ask themselves or when we're you know, approaching someone that's upset, it's like, what are you feeling? What are we feeling? And really pulling back the layer because once we start approaching our anxiety and our mental health with more curiosity, it helps us get, um, it helps us get to those deeper, more vulnerable emotions of you know, guilt, sadness, um, fear, um, really pulling back the curtain and becoming curious with these emotions will give them space to actually um, take form and, and, and release from, from your body. And as Mike says, you know, when you keep your emotions inside, it makes, makes them sick. And it's the same with everyone. So it's really becoming more curious about, you know, what are we feeling versus what's wrong? Because one of the biggest things that I see happening or I see happening with this pandemic, that's going to be a huge problem for any founders or organizations that are saying, you know, maybe mental health isn't as important right now is, if you think about it, everyone is going through this massive change right now in the comfort of their own home. And if they're lucky, they're surrounded by a significant other or friends and family that are there to help support them. So the same shift is gonna happen whenever the pandemic is over, except all of these vulnerable emotions, people are gonna default back to those original ways of trying to wear a mask, and they're going to be surrounded by essentially strangers that they haven't seen for a while. And if you aren't right now as a leader putting in space to help people understand what, what they're feeling, six months from now when they're back in the office and you're trying to go, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong with, with 300 people in your company, like it's going to be absolutely like crazy. So now is the time. Now is the time to work with your team to help them get curious about their emotions so that they can learn to become figure out what's what they're feeling versus what's wrong no well said and i think to tie into all of that it sounds like as a business as a family person as an individual as a person in a group i think you have to start to take little steps and, and asking people how they're feeling and what they're going through and uh you know to open people up uh, i'm a big fan of storytelling uh, i think that for me i have to tell a story in order for people to understand what i'm saying probably because Maybe half the things I say don't make any sense. The story really makes it make sense. Um, but I think if that's the way to get other people to open up, then I think that you got to share a little bit, right? And I think people will start to feel that. Uh, they'll want to feel part of it uh, and they'll want to share as well. And I think sometimes like even to the subject matter that, that we've called it, you know, don't suffer in silence. I think a lot of people are suffering in silence because they don't know how to open that part up. They don't know how to reach out to that one person and just share a little bit about themselves. Um, and it tends to get carried on too far until you can't or you need a uh, bigger intervention. And hopefully today, a lot of people have learned that uh, we all have to be a little bit vulnerable. We all have to share a little bit and to normalize anything that's going on in the world, especially around mental health. Uh, we all need to help each other and we need to talk a little bit and uh, not only share a little bit about ourselves, but share other stories that we hear so that people will feel that I'm not the only one that's stuck in this, or I'm not the only one that lost my job, or I'm not the only one that has to fire 300 people, that, that we all are going through these difficulties. And the only way to do it is to talk, communicate, and uh, do it together. So um, from that, I want to say thank you very much. I, I would honestly love to talk all day because we could cut this into a million versions and post this everywhere, uh, because I think this was a fantastic conversation. And hopefully this conversation turns into way more conversations just like this. And I hope you guys get put onto a million other panels because uh, I think that this is a, a really amazing 
um, topic that needs to be normalized. And uh, hopefully from all the discussions we had, we were able to uh, really pull out a lot of those pieces. Um, it, feels, uh, it feels like we hit the, the, the segments that I really was hoping to talk to. And uh, I do again, appreciate you guys for, for everything. And if I can get you guys just to stay on here so we can do a, a Zoom selfie, if you will, um, so that we can post this out. But I, I do appreciate all your time again, guys. It was fantastic. Um, and I think it fit, hopefully, the timing. And if we can do this again, we certainly will. So thank you for that.